Oh, that cat wants off, bro. Oh, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really good that we've brought in an English person to talk about the English League. <laughs> probably is what a are good you talking? What do That's you true. mean? Like three Americans and an Aussie <laughs> can't talk soccer? Soccer, <laughs> soccer, soccer. Do you guys get a lot of hate for that? Do you get a lot? Yeah. Of hate? Uh, Tyler does. It's more the Americans. Yeah. I don't really get that yeah. much hate for. Her. That's because you sound British. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. pretty much every American you sound British, Sam. That's because you're all idiots. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> true. Pretty much. Pretty much. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome you back to I don't know what this is, like the seventh episode of the Master of Debators podcast. Today we are discussing the season review, the season that was in the BPL, and we thought, as we just said, it'd be a great idea for us to be joined by some new blood JCC, the actual only Englishman. Maybe ever to be on this podcast. Have we had an English? You've person? had Rich and Jack. Katsu. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> In so the last podcast, too. <laughs> <laughs> but we are going to go ahead and be discussing the BPL season, uh, various other topics. First, I'd like to go ahead and introduce the lovely, lovely panel. Uh, first and foremost, I already introduced them. JCC or John, say hello to the people. Hello, hello. Of course, uh, JCC is known primarily on them YouTubes. For his uh, tenacious, tenacious VFL play. He's a pro clubs player. Probably have him on for if we have a pro clubs discussion. And at any time, guys, if you want to go ahead and check him out or check any of the other people out or check myself out, go ahead and click on any of the borders. I'll go ahead and uh, leave up one of those annotations. And anytime you just click on one of our beautiful faces, it'll take you to that channel and go ahead and subscribe because everyone on here does very high quality content. Speaking of high quality content, Tyler. <laughs> Say hello to the people, T Ray, all day. Hello again. For like the uh, Sam, time. Sam, Hi. the Lord Commander, hey, and Jason, aka Flickify, coming in from Seattle. Hello, hello. All right, and without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Let's get into the podcast, and we're going to start off with something really important. You know that just has to be said about this miraculous season. Uh, you know, in the BPL, and that is that Manchester United won the FA Cup. Oh, nothing else matters, right, Sam? Nothing else absolutely. really matters. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. We won the FA Cup. Doesn't matter if we didn't get top four. We got the FA Cup, man. That's all I really wanted going into this season. Yeah, that's... I was like, forget Champions League. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we can finish, it. you know, 16th it. and win the FA Cup. I'd be pretty happy with that. That's a good season. Yeah, I remember you said that at the start of the season, Sam. So, yeah, you know. I did. Yeah. Yeah, there, we, there we guys go. Any guys? Any anybody else actually give a crap about the FA Cup? No, yeah, I'm happy I, that you guys won something. I think my granddad probably does, but <laughs> nobody else nowadays, you know, cares that yeah. much about it. Unless you were an Arsenal fan, uh, basically like a year ago, two years ago, basically don't yeah. really care. Yeah, yeah. But the, now, you could see the difference between United fans and Arsenal fans. Arsenal fans, they won two in a row and they thought, you know, this is it. We're going to go do something in the league, going to challenge in the Champions League. We've won it and we're like, yeah, cool, but we want to do better next year. Like, we're not dwell, we're not sitting back and like accepting the FA Cup, whereas I feel like Arsenal fans were like, yeah, fourth and FA Cup, that's good enough. Well, we, yeah. we could take this. I think I watched it and then I went grocery shopping. Like, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah. I'm over it. I'm over it. But let's move on to the big story of uh, what happened this year and of course that is Leicester freaking city who has their fucking phone Tyler. on Tyler it's definitely it's the Tyler. fuck the fuck <laughs> how many times has this happen anyway let's keep on going okay. let's, let's not top, let this top, derail top. anything of course Leicester win the league after being absolutely relegation fodder by most pundits at the start of the season of course they're very famous for I believe at the the January break last season, they were bottom of the league and then somehow absolutely stormed it from that point on. And then, you know, the story goes, the whole uh, sex debacle in in Thailand, they get rid of their coach, you know, um, Nigel Pierce, uh, Nigel, I believe. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, um, they bring in Ranieri. Everybody didn't really like him either. And then they, uh, they kind of fucking won the league at 5,000 to one guys i pose to you if you had bet money on lester five thousand to one what would you be doing right now jcc i think i would have cashed out like a little bitch in like november <laughs> i would have <laughs> taken like the three thousand and just ran and i'd be sitting Wait. here crying <laughs> so so you could actually do that i don't know if that's if you could do that in America, yeah yeah but so you... there was like a lot of people who obviously you bet on it and then they give you like reduced 
odds on a return, but you can cash out. And I think obviously November was a bit premature, but like people were cashing out like February, January with a lot less, you know, still yep. some people cashed out with like 30,000, but still losing out on like 80,000. Those are some of the stories I read. Like, you know, you'd be, you'd be pissed. I wouldn't be. I'd be happy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thirty thousand, five thousand to one. You still get like three, three thousand to one. That'd be insane. Tyler, what would you be doing with that kind of money? Not be talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> fucking, straight up, you fucking Just asshole. Up. Like Love you come you. in here and have your phone all blared, and all of a sudden Love you, you. Give, me this, <laughs> give me this shish. You give me this shit. Sam, what would you be doing with all that cash right now? Um, I'd probably be applying for my psychic license. I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> I predicted that Leicester would win the league, so I could I could be a psychic. That's what I I'd make more money as well. People would come in, I'd tell them, you'll be fine, don't worry, and yeah. then I'll get I make money off of it. Yeah, and Jason, what will you be doing with that scroller? Maybe uh, investing in like a consulting firm, saying, you know, I'm the guy that predicted Leicester win the league. Get other people to pay my bets. <laughs> oh, so basically, you and Sam would be <laughs> in the same business, yeah. essentially. Could I could be about. his psychic. Yeah, I could be his predictor. Yeah, there you go. There you go. One person calls it psychic. The other person calls it consulting. There you guys go. Good marketing for both of you guys. Now, what what is there to really be said about Leicester winning the league that really hasn't been said about, you know, from all the other sporting outlets? You know, everybody did, really didn't. Who? But I'll ask to you guys, what do you think was the main factor in Leicester's magical season, was it a certain player? Was it Ranieri? Was it the management? Was it the fans, per se? Like, what do you guys think were the major factors in what... Because it's not even close. They won by 10 points. 10 points clear of Arsenal. And absolutely, they had a, a scintillating record pretty much against almost any of the top-tier teams. Well, pretty much up against, up against anyone. They absolutely stormed it. They never really faded. What do you guys think was the, the main factor? Does anybody want to pick this up? I don't really have an answer to it. Mine's actually the opposite. I mean, they've got, they got aging players. They've got players that people have never heard of. They've got a manager who's never won a league, who, you know, had a terrible time at Chelsea. when I think he did all right, but, you know, he got sacked and Mourinho came in and he was the special one and, you know, they won everything. So I was, even as you were just listing their accomplishments, you just can't, you know, playing a four-four-two in the Premier like, what's that about with two strikers? Like, who does that? So I can't, I, yeah, I can't even begin to, to say where they went, how they did it, to be honest. It's mm. crazy. But what would, you, what would you say if there would be one thing that really stood out to you was the main thing that really it's brought the, them to the it's fruition? It's the hard work, isn't it, really? Like, they all just run in the hard work off the ball, you know, I mean, you'd seen goals like the Jamie Vardy, the Liverpool goal, you know, the one that was almost Ooh. one of the goals this season. He just chased that. That was just a pretty much a clearance from Mahrez. He saw him, he just chases it down and just has a hit. And it's just that sort of, you know, a lot of a lot of these Premier League strikers were just, you know, let's look at Giroud. He just, ah, oh, that, that's gone. Goalie's hands, he'd leave it. <laughs> goal, you know, you've got players like Vardy sprinting after the ball. Yeah, hard work. Hard work. Yeah, Probably that's... Yeah, that's definitely a hallmark of their Tyler, what do you think was the the main? Like I said, it's uh, all about being a team. Like they all just kind of sat back, played on the counter. They had like Conte running after the ball. Once he won it back, Vardy and Mares all on the counter attack. Like with all that pace, it was always like Albrighton even at some points during the season was cutting down the wing. And it was just that counter attacking football that Ranieri brought in that actually just helped them do well. Mm, that is that is a good point. I mean, they've they were. How long have they they've been top of the league? Like for how long? Pretty like it early. pretty much seemed like the whole entire oh, season. Yeah, a long time. Yeah. yeah. Long time. And Tyler brings up a very good point. Their their style is very hard working and counterattacking and the whole aspect of them, you know, being a top of the league, that means it kind of played into the factor of them being a counterattacking team. Everybody had to come at them. They had to chase after them. And even when the big teams came in or they had to go to the big teams, they had to come at them and able to get that spot and it played right into the play style. So that is that is a, a very interesting point, Sam. Who do you pinpoint as uh, the main key or and why this magical thing just happened? Um, I put it down to Ranieri more than anything. I think he plays down what he did a lot. You got a group of eleven players that really I don't think any of them have won a pre not not a Premier League, let alone a trophy. Um, and he just pretty much went in there and said, "You guys can do it." Like it's eleven versus eleven. When you really strip everything away from football, it's eleven men versus eleven men. Well, what's the difference? 
you know. So if you run hard, if you just know that you can do it, then you can do it. And I think Ranieri, like a lot of people give him a lot of credit, but people are saying, you know, Mahrez was this good, uh, Kante was this good. And I think, I, I think he just instilled that belief in him. And I know it's a bit cliche, you know, but I genuinely think that's what he did. He just walked in the dressing room and he said, there's no reason you guys can't win this game. Just do what you do. Play with confidence, play with flair, and and you know if it works out, it works out. You know, no one expects us to do anything, so let's just go out there and put everything into it. And yeah, they won the league. I don't even think you could just put it on Ranieri though, because I mean, last season when they were at the bottom of the table and they were playing outstanding football for like the remainder of the season to survive, like they didn't have Ranieri as their manager, so I can't really say you can put it just on him, but he's definitely helped their confidence this season. That is true. I think yeah, there was some that's statistic. What I'd say. Yeah, there was some statistic. I think at like the second half of the season, they had scored more points, or they had uh, they had more points than any other team to close out the season. But it does. I mean, I I do see Sam's point as well. Is that you need like they often say that coaches, yeah, it's part tactics, but a lot of the top coaches that we've seen in other sports, it's a lot of psychology. And to, in order for you to take a team that's never been in that real like in that position and keep them cool headed, keep them level headed, when you know, when you see the likes of Tottenham and Arsenal just absolutely bottle it, you have to give Ranieri, you know, uh, a lot of credit. Yes, you can put it on the temperament of the players as well, but um, you got to give it to him. He he looks like your old grandpa or your old uncle that just gives you, you know, <laughs> like a, like go out there have some fun. But I get if he's kind of that perfect fit for that team, I guess. Jason, do you have a real pinpoint for this? And I also have uh, another follow up question that you guys can all kind of jump in after this is. To put in perspective, and I would say probably JCC, you've, you've been watching the BPL longer than probably any of us. I don't know how to explain this to an American fan. Like, how outrageous this is. Like, is this the equivalent of, like, I guess, like a college team or a university team, you know, winning a championship? Like, uh, to what degree do you think, like, how would you explain this to, to someone who doesn't really understand football or soccer yeah i mean for me like i've been trying to do that to people like my in my family who you know are like girls and all that sort of thing trying to explain it and you just can't you there's no comparison in any other form of life like it's it's like it's it's just so monumental it's like you know i don't follow football too much but i know the the system it is literally like a bunch of has-beens and a bunch of Terrible, just players who, you know, players like the starting right back for Leicester, Danny Simpson, who was kicked out of QPR in the championship. So the league below, he was told he was rubbish, signed for Leicester and still plays every single game and they win the league. It's that, that sort of, it is the ultimate, um, the ultimate underdog story. It just is. There's no, there's no other way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. Jason, trying- what do you, what, how would you relate this to maybe like an American fan or someone who's doesn't really can really grasp this you know it's it's hard to relate it because <clears throat> you mentioned like ncaa basketball but that is only like one or two months at a time lesser have been doing it for months and it's they've been able to maintain this form really stick with the the mesh message of the manager and like if i had to explain it like i don't know maybe there was that example where like oakland the the baseball team they use like economics to make very Signings that made statistical sense. Moneyball. And yeah, Moneyball with Brad Brad Pitt. <laughs> and um, Jonah Hill. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um and I think Lester have done that in sorts, you know. They've they brought in some players that fit that play style. And I think I agree with Sam that it had a lot to do with the manager. I think like what he did during his halftime talks, he told them play smart because you're foxes or something. I read that <laughs> read that in an article. That's just cheesy I, thought, fun. I thought that was pretty <laughs> unbelievable. But um yeah, I think it had a lot to do with the manager. And, of course, you know, just the players working hard, like it's been mentioned. All right, after hearing that about the halftime talks, I think, Sam, I think your point is mute. we got to take credit away from Ranier. <laughs> for play smart. <laughs> your yeah. Boxes. Going, going back to Tyler's point, he was saying how they were playing amazing football at the end of last season when they were going to, well, they looked like they were going to get relegated. You could say that about a lot of teams. Like Sunderland have played fantastic at the end of this season. You don't really expect them to go on and, you know, win the league next season or do well in the league next season. Eh? They've done it a few seasons in a row, and then they've started the next season terrible. That's why I'm putting so much credit for Ranieri, because he got them continuing that play when they didn't need to survive just at the start of the league. That That's where I put the credit to Ranieri. 
So would you say it would be wise next season to place a bet on Sunderland to win the league? It's only yeah. 350 to 1. So if they get a new points. manager. See, that's yeah. wait, Ty, what Tyler said is outrageous is that Sunderland's odds are 350 to 1. <laughs> Next season, yeah. how is well? I guess it's because Leicester actually won the league. Yeah, odds makers are like, no, nah, fuck that. We're not paying that yeah. much money. To <laughs> change the how, game. How much money do you think odd makers? Uh, odd makers. What am I even saying right now? I can't even speak American English right now. How much money do you think? Like, but like they lost this season. They're incredible. Lots. I don't know how many people do they have a number of how many people <laughs> bet it on Leicester to win the league. Mm, uh, I'm pretty sure those those aren't available to the public, <laughs> to be yeah. honest. And I'm pretty sure you could probably count on your hands or toes how many people bet on Leicester. But wasn't there that like one story of that guy who always bets on Leicester? Yeah, and then the he league? didn't this Yeah, year. there are fans yeah. like that, yeah. Oh, but I wouldn't yeah. even so, like, how many of those fans would have actually bet it on Leicester, like... No, but this guy bet every single year for like I don't know, God knows how long. And then That's for what some saying, reason, but yeah, not all Leicester fans are like that. There was a, there's a few of them. I'm assuming that like the, I know a lot of people that bet on their sports team no matter what. But I mean, how many of the Leicester fans would have actually put money on them winning the league? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's not too mm. bad. Uh, well, speaking like, of which, there's a good example. There's there's a good example of like somebody like a, a dad or a grandpa who bet money on his grandson the day he was born to grow up and i can't remember for the life of me what team it was but it was like manchester a league united one. oh was it there was there was a Maybe guy was. who, who bet on his kid to play for man united yeah I and it was like they gave him odds of like i don't i can't remember the exact figures but it was less than the odds of leicester winning the league so leicester are an established football team nobody expects them to win the league but they're a, they're a football team in the top division or around there and somebody had like less odds on his grandkid to grow up and play for one of the best teams in the world and that, yeah that you know it's crazy that's fucking uh, that's fucking mind-blowing man wasn't there like better odds at the beginning of the season for like the pope to play for rangers and elvis <laughs> to be alive than last hey, man. League? elvis i could see but yeah Lester but the pope yeah. Paint playing for rangers is just like what yeah that that had to is that true? The yes, Pope, it's true. The Pope to play for Rangers. Had better odds than Leicester winning the league. Yes. That makes no sense. That makes no good. Okay, that's absolutely ridiculous. But I think the other big story about Leicester winning the league is that every single year you hear the same rhetoric from Arsenal fans, from, um, well, basically Tottenham. You, you hear from all kind of like the big to mediocre clubs is if only our team, you know, had spent the money. If only we had gotten so-and-so player if only we had opened up the war chest and gotten that player we could have won the league you hear it mostly from arsenal fans i'm sorry if i'm picking on you but then we hear we see plucky old lester who is their most expensive signing this year probably conte but barely uh, yeah barely yeah. who who under yeah well like or i don't even know or something or because one of their strikers was a couple million as well yeah. but nothing yeah nothing yeah and now they come along and they just don't they just don't win the league. They win it 10 points clear. And with the, pretty much like they had like a game left. It was kind of an anticlimactic season. Like if we're going to be honest, like it was a really, it was, some people were saying it's like, this is the greatest season in, you know, in a generation or something is the most outstanding season. And then it was really great. It was like an amazing movie, uh, like from front to start until the very end. And then it just kind of sputtered out at the end because one, you know, it's, it's cool that they won, but it's it's not as cool when it's just like kind of a Snapchat video of everyone around a TV screen, you mm -hmm. know, when they win. Mm -hmm. And then maybe yeah. you could have said, yeah, like the final day was like, oh, well, there's intrigue between Manchester City and Manchester United, you know, to battle it out for that fifth place spot. But then apparently some security company forgot their fake bomb at <sighs> uh, Old Trafford. And then, you know, well, it's just it's just Man City playing right there. And that kind of sputtered out as well. But I digress. What are you? What do? What does this? What does this mean, guys? Can people do the argument? Is there still a lot to be said about paying those big bucks for big players, or should there be more of a focus on maybe a money ball type? You know what Jason said of you know getting players that kind of fit a system, getting a a a uh, um, a coach that kind of fits the system. Jason, what do you think? Since you brought up the money ball thing, yeah, I mean it's hard to implement, I think, because. It would have been difficult for Lester, so you know that you know Mares is gonna excel so well with the the players around him. It's I think football, it's it's a team sport. Whereas baseball, you know, you can more rely on individuals to perform, you know, get on base and all that stuff. But you really need a team to gel together to work in football or soccer. So it's a bit harder to implement, I think. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's true. It's is it is. It, I don't know if we're ever going to see a story like <clears> this. Like even now, like who could have actually predicted this? But I don't know, Sam. Do you think that this this leads arguments to you know this could be done? Do you do you think in your lifetime you could see something similar to this be done? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think, like, there wasn't even just one player that they signed that was no one knew, and then they beasted it. Like, you look at Mahrez and Kante as the big two, but you got to give a lot of credit to the centre-backs. I think Robert Huth was pretty freaking amazing this season, and who the hell is Robert Huth? He played for, what, Fulham, who are struggling in the championship now. I don't know. I think it was just, like, they signed players that you didn't expect to do well, but all of them stepped up. I don't see that ever happening. Maybe a team signs one or two players that step up during a season that no one knows that they signed for half a million or a million, but a whole team of them to do that again, I don't think so. I don't see it happening. Hmm. So, Tyler, would you prefer, you know, your beloved team, Newcastle, um, you know, <laughs> would you prefer that they go they go on the same route as they did last season? You know, signing you know big name players for big money, or going more for trying to find this kind of magic in a pot? Uh, basically, trying to sign people that kind of fit more into their system. They should have buy Premier League proven. That's all they needed to do, and they spent money on Cabela and Tovan, who did absolutely nothing. But I guess more to the point, like. You said Leicester are signing players that aren't really, you know, known. And meanwhile, other teams are signing big name players that can be said about Newcastle as well. Like Sissoko is a big name player, but he doesn't show up for half the season. Meanwhile, the whole Leicester team, no one knows who they are, and they're playing as a team for the whole season. And Newcastle has all those big players that aren't showing up game in, game out, because they're looking at Newcastle as kind of that stepping stone to a bigger club. And meanwhile, Leicester, they're like, yeah, this could maybe be a step up to a bigger club, but right now we might as well go ahead and play as hard as we can as a team and win as much as we can. So I I don't know. Hmm. And uh, JCC, do you think this is this is going to change things? Do you think we're going to see more teams kind of spending less, or do you think the big money is still going to pay big money? You know, I think ultimately it just cranks up the pressure on the managers, like the, the big managers. You look at Mourinho coming in to Man United, he's going to have... 200 to play with 200 million if a team like Leicester or someone else finish above him again you know you can't call it a one-off um every season it's hard work coming in so these you know we all know how these uh the heads of these clubs work like Abramovich and everything sacking managers left right center if you're sitting there now as Abramovich going okay I gave all of this money all of this and someone who I deem not good enough 10 years ago comes in and clean sweat like like cleanly wins the league um, I think it's gonna. There's gonna be even more sackings. I think there will be. I think you know it's gonna increase the rate of sackings in the in the top half of the teams. Mm. And to your point, you were saying uh, right there. You're saying that maybe you know Leicester finishes above uh, Chelsea next season. Where do you guys see Leicester finishing next season? Mm. Top four? Do you think they make top four next season? Let's start at that no. point. Tyler says no. I, I say top eight. I don't see them finishing in a Champions League spot. They have Champions League next season. We'll have to worry about another competition. I don't mm. see it. Anybody mm. else? Top four. I have, to, I have to go no for top four. No. no. I think Tyler made a great point. Extra fixtures. I don't yeah. know how they'll deal with that. I don't know how far they got in their cup runs for FA and Capital One, but I don't really remember them playing late cup games, so... No. I think <clears throat> I think that's going to be difficult for them to manage four different competitions. They'll probably do well in at least three or four of those competitions. So I I don't know. I'm not you sure. Can look at, you can look at you can look at Hull a few seasons ago, what, one or two when they were in Europa League. They had all those extra fixtures. They didn't have enough squad yeah. depth, and they got relegated. It so, happens with a lot of teams. Yeah. Yeah. So what's a what's a successful season for them? What do you think is a good season for Leicester? Next in top four. I'll say get back in the Champions League. I don't think. But if they don't get top four, you think that's bad? You think that's a? That would be. I think now after winning the league and getting Champions League, uh, Tyler's freaking the fuck out over there. (laughs) (laughs) But I, I think, (laughs) I don't know if I were to put my yeah if I were to put myself in the shoes of like a Leicester fan. Now that you tasted, you know, a win, is that enough? Are you be like, okay, I realize, you know, I'm realistic. This is only. It was only like one year. It was magic. And I think, yeah, actually, I'd be like, okay, if they even get like 
anything above relegation next year, I was like, okay, it was a magical season. I could live with that. You know, I, mm-hmm. I was alive during that time. But there, I know there's going to be some people out there that'd be like, well, we've seen them do it. They could do it again. You should learn to expect. Like, it shouldn't be a one and done. You shouldn't be like a Blackburn, you know? Like, if you were able to do it this season, why not be able to do it the next season? But I don't know if Ranieri is, is I'm going to be a little bit critical. I don't know if Ranieri is the right coach to do back-to-back or to have back-to-back success. Because well, if you look at, like, it's always going to be difficult. He, I guess. he said he wanted a top half of the table finish next season. He That's what he's aiming for, top 10. Yeah. Um, to sort of just build on it. But I think it'd be less surprising if they made Champions League next year than it was for them to win the league this year. So, like we're saying, oh, no, it's not going to happen. But, I mean, <laughs> look at what's happened this season. They could make top four. I don't know. I just I think it's going to be one of those things where they sort of fill in that Everton role almost like a yeah, there'll be a, a consistent top six, top eight side. They're going to deal with I think maybe losing Kante, potentially Mares. I don't know if Ranieri can keep a hold of them. They obviously like playing for their manager, but it's not going to be a thing where they can do this every season where they sign players that are going to like I was saying before that are going to step up that no one knows. You know, it's going to. You know, they're going to lose their good players and they're going to have to start replacing. It's going to be really different for them in the next few seasons trying to get a cycle of good players rather than just one season where everybody steps up. That's why I think they might struggle as well next season. I honestly think if they could get top 10, that would be really good, but I think they'll finish top eight. I think Everton, I don't see them in the top eight next season. I just, even with a new manager, I just don't. Like, I think they could really fill in that role. I think they'll be roughly around around 7th, maybe 6th, depending on how Liverpool and stuff like that go. And I think that'd be really good for them. I think they should enjoy that. Because you've got to look at like you got to look at all the teams that'll be in the top half of the table, including West Ham now with their new stadium. They've got Europa League as well. You've got to like, think about how many good teams there are. If they all step up, and Southampton, yeah. If, if, um, if they all step up and if none of them really bottle it like what Chelsea did this season, or you could argue what Liverpool have been doing for several seasons now, if they're all challenging four European spots, it'll be that much tougher on Leicester. I just think this season, no one really wanted it, so Leicester just blew the league. And I just don't see that happening every season. So I honestly think if they can get a top eight finish, that'd be really good for them. Yeah, you could you could definitely make an argument that, that Leicester kind of won the league by default, just nobody really won it. So did Leicester really win the league, or did all the big teams kind of bottle it? I think that's uh, an interesting like thought as well, since they did win by so many points. But you guys mentioned teams like Southampton, like West Ham. I think it's a nice little transition that we go ahead and talk about how the top half of the table kind of wrapped up this year. Of course, <sighs> Spurs... The end of the season, we're wrapping it up right here. Leicester, we're on top with 81 points. Arsenal coming in second place with 71. Spurs coming third. Yeah, third with 70 on the last game of the season. Man City, of course, come in with 66 points tied with Manchester United. But, of course, they were ahead on goal differential. We have lost Tyler. He is just so distraught. He's so distraught that, that Manchester United have finished outside of the championship. I think he spot. thought about Newcastle United. And what they <laughs> just, you know what? Before we get to that, before we get to that, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Yeah, yeah he's, he's a well. Newcastle fan. I think he's gone, oh, top half of the table. This doesn't concern me. I'll, just leave here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. I'll be back to discuss Newcastle. Um, and of course, uh, just to round out the top six, uh, Southampton uh, going ahead and getting in and the sixth position as well as West Ham coming in in seventh, which was a little bit surprising to me. I'm gonna be honest, uh, I didn't even know. I'm gonna be straight up honest. I didn't even know that, that Southampton finished in the sixth position. Uh, is there what were the biggest stories besides Leicester in this you know top four to six that you felt like was kind of like the story of the season? Uh, Sam, what do you think uh, out of this? You know, Arsenal, Spurs. I think it's criminal that Arsenal came second. I think they definitely did not deserve to come second. I think Spurs did. The fact that they bottled on last season. I wanted Spurs to finish above Arsenal. You know, I wanted it to finally happen. Didn't happen. Um, so I guess a lot of people saying that Spurs' season was uh, like a failure because of that. I don't think so. They got Champions League football. That's incredible for Spurs. Think about how many times they've nearly been there or even that year that they actually got fourth and then Chelsea won the Champions League. They didn't get Champions League football. So I think it's been a long time coming for Spurs. So I think... They've done all right. City coming fourth, tied with points on United. With United, that is absolutely criminal. There's no way 
that United, and I'm a United fan, but there's no way we should have been on par with City there. There's no way our team, our squad, should be top. They only got, Champions League got goal difference. That's because we didn't score enough goals. Imagine if we were a goal-scoring machine this season. First of all, we wouldn't have been I fifth. I can't but- imagine that. <laughs> we wouldn't have been fifth, but also our goal difference would be... Imagine City, this City team, who have arguably some of the best players in the league, Aguero, one, probably one of the best players in the world, and barely making top four. You know, a lot of people say it was because of Pep and stuff like that, you know, being announced, and I can understand that, but it's still criminal that they came fourth in this league. They should have blitzed it. Southampton, I think, a lot of people just overlooked. The, uh, like you said, you didn't even know that they came sixth, but Ronald Koeman has been doing, like, fantastic work. He's one of my favorite managers in the league. And I think I'm really happy for Southampton. You've got to think this is a team that's only been in the Premier League now for three, four years, maybe, since they got promoted the first time. Yeah. And, they, and they've built, you know, every season I think they've gotten better with the exception of maybe one season where they uh, moved down in positioning. But they've been getting better every season. Uh, West Ham's going to have a new stadium. So, I mean, the top half of, top half of the table next year is going to be a, a really heated contention like to see who's going to get those spots because you've got so many teams now emerging and it's going to be uh, it's going to be fun to watch yeah. and there you go like you you mentioned like uh, Southampton that is kind of a really good model that you can kind of see that Leicester could kind of take after you know ones that come up they do pretty well well better than <laughs> Southampton uh, ever has but uh, basically hopefully you, you hope that they can go ahead and build and yeah as you can say you know people say that you know I would I would admit this too. I think La Liga is a better league. You can argue that Bundesliga is probably a better league. Uh but competition wise, I think it's no contest. And entertainment wise, in my personal opinion, there's no like there's not a more competitive league and there's not a more entertaining league than uh the English league. Um Jason, do you think who should be I'll, I'll kind of pose this a little bit differently. Who do you think should be more disappointed in their season? Should it be Spurs fans or should it be Manchester United fans? That is a difficult question to answer. I think by the end of it, definitely Spurs fans. Um, Just because they were really, they were competing for like top of the table up until pretty late until Leicester finally started, you know, pulling away with it. Um, And for them to finish behind Arsenal, I think that's that's super tough on Spurs fans. Um, Man United, honestly, I feel like you guys picked up a little bit towards the end of the season. I thought towards the middle and up, uh, like at the beginning of the season, like everyone's getting Louis van Gaal out. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough to say. I think you guys shouldn't be too angry with where you finished considering your position this year. Uh, JCC, do you, uh, who do you, you can go ahead and answer that question or do you think there's a, or if you have some other point that you would like to talk about in the top six, you can go ahead and uh, drop that knowledge. <laughs> well, I think I think I'd be more disappointed as a Spurs fan um, because you've been taken up to that point of thinking, okay, we, you know they got to believe. Man United fans, I'm a Man United fan. Sam is as well. We never thought that we were going to win the league at any point. Sam, but um, Samuel, I didn't know. Sam- <laughs> I, I didn't know he was a United fan. I thought he was a Southampton fan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, but you know, you got if you're a Spurs fan, you thought we might we might do this, we might do this. But they shouldn't be too disheartened with the, the you know they're making up probably six starting places in the England squad, England team yeah. for the Euros, five or six. Yeah. Um, they're going to keep their players. I think we can argue that Leicester might lose some of theirs, but I don't think any. There's no Kane's not going anywhere. Did uh, uh, Ali, Dyer, Rose? They're all going to stay. Yeah, all their performers. So I think you know they've got a good manager. If they can, they can, they've got more to be confident about than the Man United fans even at the end of the season because I, I've just changed my point. I've gone from being more disappointed <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is long, long, looking long term if you're a Spurs fan you've, you've got um, some concrete in place if that makes sense. You're, you, know, you know where you're going whereas Man United fans it's like okay hang on we've got Mourinho now but how long is he staying for? What's, what's that happening? We're still not in the Champions League. We still look shaky. We've still got a lot of trash that needs to be cleared out in our squad. Yeah, so that, I, I think Spurs fans should be, should be. Optimistic. I would be excited if I was a Spurs fan. I'd be yeah. really excited. Like they don't really have any old players that are starting for them. Their team is relatively young. The manager's relatively young. Like they could really new build stadium. something. Uh, new, stadium new stadium as well. Like if they went on to win the league in the next couple of seasons, the next few seasons, I don't think anybody would be surprised because that is that team can win the Premier League. Like, it, it can. 
it's a really solid team. You look at Ericsson, Dyer, Ali, Kane, Lamella even. They're not old players. None of them, you know, they all still have five solid seasons in their prime. You know, taking a look at maybe Lamella or Ericsson getting older quicker than someone like Deli Ali, but they all have so many seasons in them left that within those seasons, that team should be winning a league. And I would be really excited as a Spurs fan because it's been a while since they've won one and they can go ahead and do it. Yeah. yeah and their foreign oh. players are established internationals now, like Alderweire, Vertonghen, Lloris, Dembélé, Lamella, and then you've got the English players coming through, obviously. So they, they've got, yeah, they should be excited for sure. I'd be. Yeah, I could distill your your thoughts, JC. I think in the short term, it's definitely going to be more disappointing as a Spurs fan, especially with the stinger at the end of the season of Arsenal fans. And if you're on the Twitter, you should have just not been on Twitter for about a week. <laughs> After that end of the season, like that must have, I cannot even imagine to have your bitter rivals just absolutely just smear that shit in your face (laughs) the end of the season. But long term, I would say that, yeah, as a Manchester United fan, I would be more disappointed. You're out of Champions League once again, so that might hurt you in signing future players. You look at the squad and you even compare squad to squad with, with Spurs. It's no contest. Just the, we got like one or two exciting young players and then you pretty much, up and down that roster at Spurs is good, young, exciting players. And if you're going to look at it for the long term, you got a great coach. And it was like, you got a great coach. You got a really solid base that's, that's, that's growing and building. And yes, they didn't, well, they kind of bottled it, but they didn't, you know, they didn't fade like old Spurs. You know, like they, they, they had a new mentality this season, which I think is the biggest move forward for Tottenham, even with all that talent and with all, you know, better coaching. They didn't have, you know, the, the spurs that we had always known. Like in America, we have this show called Men in Blazers and they used to have a segment on it called That So Spursy in which they would showcase week to week spurs getting up by like one or two goals and then just letting it go, you know, and they would just always call it That So Spursy. And they had to change the definition of that segment of the show this year because Spurs would actually come back into games. They would actually fight off teams. They would keep leads. And I think that's the biggest movement forward for that club as a whole above anything else. And I think that they should be absolutely thrilled about like what the future holds for them if they can maintain that kind of killer instinct and, you know, take it one step further. It's, it's, it's a bitter pill to swallow this year, you know, losing once again to Arsenal, but. In American sports, we often see that there are teams in the ascendance that need to get to that heartbreak moment in order for you. And if you remember that heartbreak moment and can build on top of that, that is what kind of builds future champions. Like, uh, definitely you can see it in, in American football, in the NBA, and in, 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 uh, in baseball. So hopefully, you know, Spurs can go ahead and make that next leap. I do not know where the fuck Tyler is or if we can go ahead and get it back. We might do a little bit of a technical check right now and see if we can grab him. Internet is dying. In the text. <laughs> um, if I was like, if I was a Spurs fan, I would take like, the way I see it is Spurs didn't finish above Arsenal, but I reckon Spurs win the Premier League before Arsenal. I, I see Spurs winning it first as far as who's going to do it next. I think maybe it could be City's next season. Then I see Spurs after that. I honestly, with Arsenal, even if they bring in a new manager, I still think it'll take a couple of seasons for them to, I, I honestly, I could predict, I'd put money on it. Spurs to win the league before Arsenal, if they can bet. retain their players. Yeah, i definitely take that bet. Would you guys all take that bet or would you take Arsenal? No, I'd take, I'd take the Spurs. Look at the Arsenal players putting photos on Twitter of celebrating that they beat, Spurs to second. Well done. You came second. You're worth fifty million. You've been bought for Sanchez and Urzil and all this. You, you've lost mm. the lead to Leicester. You just don't have anything to celebrate. Yeah, man. Like that is that is like it's an Ars- embarrassment. That's Arsenal. Arsenal in a nutshell, yeah. isn't it? They're cel- like we're celebrating second place. When is yeah. that when is that ever something to celebrate? You know what I'm I saying? Think that's what the class of '92. I think one of them said that the class of '92. The old Man United boys said that. They said like they seem happy. To be second is that when uh, when we were under Ferguson, if we ever came second, there was no celebrating ever yeah. at anything. Yeah. So that's the mentality you need to win leagues. Yeah. Well, uh, going from celebration to utter despair, unfortunately, just Tyler couldn't hold on. His internet is dying. Maybe that's an excuse, or maybe they, he just didn't want to talk about his beloved Newcastle. We're relegated this season. We're going to be talking about the lower half of the season, the Great Escape. Uh, he, he did it in. Big Sam did it again. We finish off, we're going to talk about the bottom four right here. Sunderland finished with 39 points, two points above Newcastle, 
who came uh, with 37. Norwich with 34. And oh, Villa. What happened to Villa with a putrid 17? Jason, I'll start it off with you. What what the fuck happened, man? What do you what the fuck do you think happened to to Newcastle, and why do you think Sunderland were were able to to nudge out their bitter rivals? I think with Newcastle players mostly lost motivation. Honestly, I'm not too familiar with Norwich City. I didn't follow them much this season, so I can't really expand upon my views for that. But I think the main problem with Aston Villa, I'm sure Benteke leaving and them bringing in you know some. Decent transfers, but not really Premier League proven. There are two. Um, can't remember the other ones at the time, but you know, just no big name transfers to replace that big Ben Teke replacement. So I think that's the main and problem. Delph. Just, Delph as well leaving. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, and I don't think Rom, they expected that really. So Ron Blar as well. Ron Blar. Ron Blar is, yeah, and he was big for for Villa. So I think that was the main reason. Too many big names leaving. Not giving enough time for replacements to find their place. Mm. JCC, what do you think uh, Sonnen was able to eke out Newcastle? Uh, two words, Jermaine Defoe. <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah. yeah, the man's a proven goal scorer. He's uh, exactly what Norwich, Villa and Newcastle didn't have. There's nothing more to say, isn't it? Proven Premier League striker. He's going to get you 12 plus goals and 15 plus, I think he got. So that's what you need. Yeah, you need to get goals, and it's, I mean, that's their, that's like Sunderland's wheelhouse, is just, that's where they're comfortable, it's like, oh, we're, we're flirting with it, we're flirting with it, but we'll get there, we'll get there, we got Big Sam, we got the foe, and we'll, we've been here before, guys, so we know how to eke it out, we know how to do a great escape, as good as anybody, that is pretty much, you know, what they're all about, and you would think, you know, Newcastle were there last year, maybe <laughs> they could have used that experience as well, but... It's just, it's absolutely, it's absolutely shocking. Um, Sab, what do you think? What do you, th why did, why did Newcastle absolutely collapse? Uh, that, that club is just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's so, it's almost like wood that's just rotting almost. It's, you just see the deterioration. It's, I mean, I don't think people understand how big of a club Newcastle are as far as how much, how much money they have. The stadium size they have, I'm pretty sure it's bigger than Stamford Bridge as far as um, yeah, attendance. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure it's probably like fourth or fifth biggest in the league as far as how many people it can yeah. see. Mike Ashley is one of the richest people that owns a Premier League club. I mean, this is a team that should be nowhere near the relegation zone. And you see the difference between Sunderland and Newcastle. Sunderland brought in Defoe. They brought in someone that played in the Premier League before, that scores goals, and Newcastle signed Mitrovic, and there's nothing wrong with Mitrovic. I think he's going to be a pretty solid striker when he's uh, a, a little bit older, when he matures a bit. But they didn't get what they needed to get. Sunderland as well. Like, how many seasons is this in a row where they've done this? <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, we're relegated, but you know what? We're not going to get relegated. Like, how many seasons? It's got to be at least four seasons now. Yeah. Like, so many, every single season, it's like, they look like they're going to go down, but something happens. And... The past few seasons, it's been a new manager coming in. Like when Poyet come in, like he got them out. Um, there was who they get last season that took him out. This season it was Sam Allardyce. Like it always seems like they just go into the relegation zone and then they bring in a new manager and he takes him out. Like it's just routine for some. Yeah, they now. got like, the recipe <laughs> down. You know, just yeah. like all right, let the first manager come in and then right around <laughs> this time, sack him, bring in a new guy. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, we got this. We got this, guys. Yeah, whereas Newcastle, I think, waited a bit too long to bring in their manager. I mean, if you're going to bring in Rafa Benitez, just bring him in as soon as you can. Like, why wouldn't you? Well, they had um, to wait until he got fired at Real, to be fair, at the start of the season. Yeah, right? when was he fired? I think he was he was fired a couple games. He was fired mid-season, and then Zidane Yeah, and they brought him in how, like, he hasn't been in... He hasn't been at Newcastle for that long. No. He's managed, yeah. what, seven games or something like that? Like, he's only been here for a couple of months. So, I don't know, man. Newcastle, I feel really bad. I don't even know if I see them coming straight back up. Like, I think they'll struggle in the championship, which is getting more competitive every year. Yeah. They're going to lose their good players. I mean, Sissoko and Wijnaldum, if you can call them good. But, 
yeah, I, I don't know. Newcastle are going to struggle. And yeah. as far as Norwich, that side is a championship side. That They don't really have that many Premier League players. They, I thought they'd go back down anyway. Villa is disappointing. Probably one of the worst teams I've seen watching the Premier League. I remember Derby in 08-09. I'm pretty sure they hold the record for the least points. They were fucking abysmal. And this Villa side reminds me of them quite a bit. So, yeah. As far as relegation, Newcastle's the only one that surprises me and that I'm upset about because... Yeah, they're a big team. They should be in the Premier League. Yeah, like Newcastle fans, if you would have told if you would have told True Jordy at the start of the season, hey, you're gonna get something like eighty million pounds worth of transfers. Mike Ashley's finally gonna open up his checkbook, and you're gonna get Rafa Benitez as your manager. He would have flipped his shit. Like that sounds amazing on paper, and then this happens. It's like. Well, they, I mean, you know, just go watch True Jordy's channel. They, you know what's up. It's, if it was a big name game, they kind of got up for it. They gave Manchester United a good run, you know, uh, both times they played them. It was, but then, you know, when you sign these big players that, that know that it's a stepping stone to another league, you, you, you don't sign them, you know, they don't believe in the club. They definitely don't believe in the club and they only are out for themselves. And, uh, speaking of, of Villa, if, if you're going to talk about how Leicester played, you know, belief, they had such belief in themselves and they played as a team, there's almost like a mirror opposite, uh, you know, when you see Villa. That was a team that believed that they were hot garbage very early on in the season and then just played that way and believed it that they just did not actually belong. That is a team that quit very, very early on. And once it got down, man, it's, it's that culture of losing. Like, once that started, there was no way that they were ever going to get back up. And that was just absolutely disgraceful. Like, Villa fans definitely deserve a little bit better than that. And I saw, what was that? Like, at one of the grounds, I think, like, some one of the fans, I forget which team, was running around with, like, a Ashton Villa coffin, like, outside of the grounds or something. <laughs> oh, man. Birmingham, yeah. That yeah. Birmingham did it, yeah. Yeah, rivals. Yeah, but I heard yeah. oh, I heard that was like that was bad blood, wasn't it? Because like they had done something similar to them when they got relegated. I think so. Yeah, they're, they're like bitter rivals from the same city. Yeah. So Aston Villa is in Birmingham. Birmingham's Birmingham's this yeah the, yeah, the, yeah. Off the city, so. Well, yeah. I mean, it's... I mean, Villa's Villa's never been relegated from the Premier League era. Like they were one of the teams that haven't been relegated. It was I think Villa, Arsenal, Liverpool, United. And maybe Everton, I think, were like the five teams. Like Villa is one of those teams that just didn't get relegated. And this season, it was just like, you just sort of knew after the first five games, like this Villa team is going down. Like there is no way they're going to survive. Yeah, that's pretty sad. Well, uh, I posed to you, you know, in the top four, you know, who should be, who should be more disappointed, Spurs fans or Man United fans? I would say... Who should be more depressed, Newcastle fans or Villa fans in this one? Uh, JCC, who do you think should be? Who is more depressed I, at this moment? <laughs> I think um, I think Villa probably because such a big club. Only four or five years ago, maybe the numbers are slightly off, but they were like in top six. They were a Southampton. They were up there and like they were doing well. Um, they've gotten rid of all of their like seemingly experienced players uh, at the start of this season. They haven't replaced them with anyone. They got uh, they had Tim Sherwood in place, who I think is a good manager. They get rid of him. They appoint some random guy who looks like Mr. Bean, and then <laughs> they Weird. have players tweeting about their fancy cars. They have the right back saying he's too good to play for the team, and if he played every game, they wouldn't get relegated. They got their club captain Ogbonnahor in Dubai smoking shisha. I mean, that's not a that's not a proper team, is it? Whereas you've got all the Leicester boys, and you can tell they're all to break it down. They're probably all mates. And they're all playing for each other, whereas the Villa guys aren't. And I think Newcastle, like you said, have been in turmoil for a couple of years now. They just haven't seemed right. And there's just a lot of dysfunction in the back room, I think, with the owner and fans protesting against the owner. Whereas Villa just seem to come out of nowhere and just drop. So I think Villa should be more disappointed if you're looking at it that way. Mm. Yeah. Jason, who do you think? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Right. Jason, who do you think should be more disappointed, or who do you think is more depressed at this moment, Villa fans or Newcastle? And and to that, uh, on that nude wrinkle, who do you think gets back up first, Newcastle or Villa? Ooh. Uh, I totally agree with JCC. I think Villa fans are are a little bit more disappointed in terms of getting back up. I think I would pick Newcastle over Villa. Um, 
I mean, they have the money to spend, and who knows? Maybe they'll they'll be back next year. I don't think that's going to happen, but I think Villa have a long ways to go, and until they make some pretty major changes, they're they're going to be in the championship. Hmm. I not only think that Villa won't get back up straight away, I fear them getting close to relegated yeah. again. I like you see what happened, what's happening with Fulham right now. Yep. Fulham were near relegation this season in the championship, and there's a few teams like Wigan Athletic who, well, I mean, got promoted now, but we're in League One this season. I fear for Villa. I really do. I, I genuinely think they'll be struggling in the championship. Bottom half, I think for sure, um, potentially near the relegation zone, which yeah. you don't want to see. So I fear for Villa, for sure. Yeah, I, I echo all of your guys' the same sentiments. I think, like, this could be kind of a good thing for Newcastle because they've been so close to being absolute, like, shit for so long that sometimes you got to burn the house down in order for you to, to, to redo the foundation and kind of bring it back up. So... I mean, that's the shining bright light here. Villa, I, I'm the same with you, Sam. I just don't know. Like, they could just be an absolute free fall and to, to be, you know, just a stalwart of the league for so many years and absolutely lose it now. That's rough, man. That is absolutely rough. But we'll go ahead and, and wrap that part up of this discussion. Let's go on to something a little bit less depressing right here. Let's talk about <laughs> transfers. Transfers, transfers. Who do you guys think was the best transfer of the season. Guys, does anybody want to hop onto this hot quick? Mm-hmm. Transfer of the season. Of the I season. know I know everybody's going to say two Leicester players, Mares and Kante. I'm going to make an argument for Jermaine Defoe. Yeah. I think without him, Sunderland will be relegated. And I think I if, we're look- yeah, if we're looking at um, taking a team from where it would have been without that player to where it is with that player... Um, I'd give Defoe a shout. Do we count him? He was like January, right? Last season? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. January. No, wasn't he January this season? No, I thought it was January. That's, wasn't that's, he that's what I was trying to think. That's why I'd, sorry for interrupting when I did. I, I was trying to say, I wasn't sure if he came in this season or not. No, I'm pretty sure he was last season in January, but technically he's still in the 2015 era. <laughs> but I get, I get what you were saying. If we're going to yeah, go yeah. back that far, like he definitely... Uh, uh, of importance of one player to a team, yeah, Jermaine Defoe is definitely pretty fucking high up there. Uh, Jason, who do you have as your your transfer of the season? I think some of the West Ham boys could be considered up there. Pied <laughs> and and Antonio both played fairly well for for West Ham, and I think it's their large reason why they finished um, what was it seventh place this year, and mm-hmm. they're in Europe again. Um, really, you would I think put Antonio it, as high. You would rate him as high as the Payet signing. I wouldn't say that, but I think he nah. was. Uh, <laughs> and you could make a you could make a case that he should have been picked for England. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would say That's just not. on his Homer Simpson celebration alone, like mm. I think you should be able to make <laughs> yes. a cele- yeah, absolutely. Not since the likes of the Peter Crouch <laughs> robot dance has the celebration been that good. Uh, JCC, who do you think uh, was your transfer of the season or your signing of the season, I guess? Well, my, I was thinking of players who have obviously shone, and the young player of the season is Ali, and he's not a signing, but he broke through this season, I think I'm right in saying, right? He start, he wasn't in the first team, was he? No, I don't think oh, last I mean, he might have had like... He was on loan, been, yes. He was on loan last season at MK, MK Dons. Dons, yeah. Yeah, so I think you can count a player like that as a transfer, effectively, but... Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Jermaine Defoe, I think, was January of 2015. So he was last season, but he, yeah. Um, probably, I'd say Deli Alley, even though he's not a transfer, bringing him back from MK Dons and just his input to that Tottenham team, that goal he scored against Palace, the flick over his head, was, yeah, just outstanding. And obviously you can say the the obvious ones like Payet and Mares and Kante. Gonna... I'll change mine from, from Defoe then, because I can't pick Defoe, because it was in January 2015. I'll go for it. Um, I will go with. Was Al Al Diverold, Was he this season? Yeah, I think he I was. So from uh, yeah, I'd probably go him. I've never seen Spurs so defensively astute before him. So <laughs> yeah. I'd probably go with him because I think yeah. he's he's been important for that Spurs team. Yeah, you could definitely make that argument. I mean, like that was that was kind of the hallmark of Spurs in in years past, is they would just leak goals late in games and kind of give them all away, and they were. One of the best defensive teams this season, if not the best, you can make an argument between either the best, them or 
them or Manchester United, I would say. Like, yeah, we consider the same. Yeah. 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 35. But but definitely, I think, you know, I think he probably won, like, first team, like, defender, uh, like, and definitely held it down. I mean, Spurs team was phenomenal. I do not know how Arsenal. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. There's just, like, some things, uh, the way that the season finished out, I was like, how did Arsenal get there? And then. Like, we didn't talk enough about Southampton. Like, how did they get sixth place? I don't remember, like, anybody really talking about them. Like, I remember, like, here and there, it was like, oh, Kuman and the boys have come up with a great win today. And now <laughs> moving on to Manchester United and Man City. Let's go ahead and talk about them, John. Um, I don't know why they have American accents in this thing. But, um, but yeah, it was just incredible, incredible stuff. I'm going to be born. I'm going to be uh, signing the season. I'm going to put, of course, Conte. Uh, just because yeah. I don't I, – there's a lot of debate this season. Like, in years – Years past, it was almost like clear cut, like who was the signing was. But I think like the the backbone and you you when you when we were talking about Leicester earlier on, we were talking about hey they're a hard working team they play for each other they put in a shift and there's a man that embodies that you know a lot of well a lot of those players embody that you would argue that Vardy definitely puts into shift both offensively and offensively. But if you're gonna look at the spine of the team and the signing this season, you would have to go Conte. A lot of questions were asked. You know, it was a one year signing last year with um Kamar Kamarasso. Uh, I, uh, I apologize. Cambiasso. Yeah, Cambiasso. Um, and then all of a sudden you bring in Conte, and now you're seeing that, you know, uh, link to Arsenal, link to Real Madrid. You know, there are all these crazy links because this player has just stepped in and filled a role. And definitely, you know, they, you know, what they say about midfielders, you know, they're kind of best when you're you're not super noticing them all that time, all that much. But he was the spine of that team, and you could say, you know, without that signing, they don't breeze the league. And I think that's why. Personally, for me, that Conte would be the signing of the season. Personally, I think Martial did pretty well, but probably not these. You know, maybe maybe he's the signing next season. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he might be the signing for it. You know, overall in the legacy of the league, he might be the signing of the season. But we will see. We'll go from best transfers, guys, to worst transfers. Who do you guys think was the worst transfer? There are three Man United fans in here, so maybe we have a word to say about a certain player. But we'll start out with Jason. Who do you think I would was? I would love to hear your opinions because I cannot think of like any individual transfers. Oh, we can. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, please. Sam, I, Sam, I would love to hear. Who do you it. think was a terrible transfer this season? Don't I know have... you want me to go with the. I know you want me to go with the United player. You don't have to. You don't have to. I'm gonna go with Florian Torvan. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think he <laughs> was probably by far the worst. Because they sent him back, didn't they? Yes. Like midway through the season. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he went back to Marseille or something. The manager like that. didn't like, want him. Yeah. yeah. Like you signed him for how much? Like 20 million or 15 million or whatever it was. And then he just goes back, like on loan. It, you spent 15 million for that, like literally nothing to send him back on loan halfway through the season. Yeah. I mean, we signed some terrible players, don't get me wrong, but we didn't send them back to the team that we signed them from halfway through the season. So that's my argument for Florian Torvan. Okay. Uh, JCC, who is your worst signing of the season? <laughs> well, um, some disappointments, but I'll stray away from United as well. Did Mangala sign this season? No, he was last season. No, He's last, last season. Last, yeah. Who did, I'm, I'm thinking of a city. We signed, uh, they signed Odomendi. Ottomendi and yeah. Delph, yeah. Ottomendi. And Sterling. And Sterling. This Delph. Time. Sterling's pretty bad a... for what you expected from him. Sterling was not really... Oh, well, yeah, with the, pri- quite... with the price tag, yeah. 50 million. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, looking at... St- I was just thinking of City as a whole, I mean, because they've really underachieved with their squad and manager and everything. Sterling, you know, is... He's in that bracket when you're bought for 15 million. You're in that bracket of a Robin, a Ribery uh thomas muller uh you know all these i don't know why all buy munich but you know neymar these wingers and you we know ability wise he's nowhere close to neymar but price wise if neymar's gone to barca for 80 million sterling's 50 million he should be you know scoring goals and winning games for city and we can all agree he hasn't scored goals or won games for man city so yeah i don't think he's i don't think he'll be in pep's plans personally if he's um, oh, that is not as a starting team. Not as yeah. a, not as in the starting team. Like, he'll, he's not um, attack minded enough. He could turn into like Nazri, like just being on the yeah. bench. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What happened? What happened to that kid? Because I remember, like, just two summers ago in like the World Cup, he was like 
all England had. It was just get the ball to this young kid, this young starlet, and have him work a little magic and cross the ball in. And I don't know. Maybe the fame. Maybe the fame. Maybe all the uh, the whippets got to him. I don't know, man. Like, Always the way with our players, man. I mean, we, we big them up so much, and we make them out to be so much better than they are. You know, we've got them like... Sterling back then in the bracket of Neymar and we did like everyone was like this kid is amazing like he's gonna like revolutionize our game and then you go and look up Neymar and Neymar's doing like rainbow flicks over people's heads in his league and smashing it in from 30 yards and Sterling's just like highlights are a couple of good crosses to Luis Suarez who scores a lot of goals and yeah. I think Sterling was his own sort of downfall because he pushed that transfer from Liverpool pushed the big transfer fee and you put pressure on your shoulders with that and if you don't turn up for City next, this season like he should have and scored 15 goals and 12 assists, you know, Mahrez sort of stats, then people are going to say you're not worth the 50 mil. Yeah, but that's... that's a, well, now it's an unfair comparison because, God, Neymar had way... I would say way more pressure than Sterling ever has had. Like, I you think, know, yeah. that combined with the World Cup, combined with this yeah. huge signing at Barca playing yeah. alongside Messi and to actually fulfill, you know... I would... It was like... I was skeptical about Neymar. You know, I was like, I don't know if you can actually do this. Like, he, I've seen a little bit of flashes, but for him to actually develop into what he was promised, that's rare, man. That's actually super yeah. rare. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, but at least Sterling scored a couple goals <laughs> this season, anyway. <laughs> Who worst, are you comparing him to? <laughs> my worst signing of the season. Although, Tomez probably a worse one. I'm going to probably admit this. And for the, for the price, I believe he came in for a hot 30 we were bragging so much shit as Manchester United fans over Liverpool. It's like, oh, you wanted this Depay kid, this Depay kid? Like, uh, we totally got him underneath your noses. Or, you know, it's like, oh, we knew. And I was like, oh, Louis van Gaal used him in, in, in the World Cup. He scored that banger from distance. He looked like the next big thing. People were saying it's like, he's going to develop into the next Ronaldo. He comes in, scores a couple pretty goals in, in Europe. You know, he looked okay in Europe. And then, um, and then proceeded to like uh, digress throughout the season. It's like he didn't get his confidence right away, and then he could never really capture it. And every single time he had maybe like a step forward, like a nice goal or a nice little trick here or there, either in Europe or in the league, it was always like a step back, like the horrendous, you know, pass that gave basically cost us the game. And oh, fucking can't even remember how many like games that were just horrendous this season, but. He wasn't the messiah that we were promised. I knew that, you know, the BPL is an extremely tough league to, to come in, especially from a foreign league, and get integrated. And I still have, have faith in the kid, but I didn't think he was going to be this bad. <laughs> you know, he, uh, like, there were just, like, times when he, it's, it's, it's a confidence thing. Like, you can just see it. He, we've seen him absolutely shred defenders you know maybe the speed but it seemed like the speed of the game was too quick for him at times and the defenders were a little bit too physical or too fast for him and he wasn't getting the calls and when he wouldn't you know the he wouldn't get enough touches or or the game wouldn't flow toward him he would get frustrated and he would try stuff that probably he wasn't you know on in the right mind of doing something but hopefully you know he's not another Di maria you know uh Mourinho can actually talk some sense into him but for me this season anyway it's probably it's probably uh, Memphis Memphis over there. Do you there. think LV, Do you think Van Gaal has something to play in that though? Well, because you can argue his philosophy does not play into the hands of players like Depay and Di Maria, like you said. Definitely. I mean, like when you when you read articles about LVG and he he absolutely hates apparently like showboating and you know doing useless tricks in his mind and. He's got a lot of bag of tricks in the kid, and you're trying to put a leash on a Ferrari, essentially. You know, you're trying to put a limiter on that Ferrari. It's not always going to work within that play style. And you can see, you know, Di Maria goes to PSG, and he becomes Di Maria once again. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's your hope? Ugh. Yeah, that's your hope, is that, you know, that, that with new management coming in, that you can kind of unleash it. And we've seen it with Mourinho before. This is a little bit hopeful thinking. But, you know, Hazard was kind of that player, too, of, you know, he had a bag of tricks, but he wasn't exactly playing for the team. And then Mourinho got a hold of him, got him into the right mindset. They won a couple, of, you know, they won a couple of leagues. So hopefully that's my hope, but I'm, I'm not holding my breath. I'm pretty satisfied with with uh, with Martial and, and that, uh, that yeah. Rashford kid. Like, he's pretty good. So, oh, that's a good one. I want to I speak to an Englishman on this one. How do you feel about Rashford going to Euros? Do you, do you wish that they would have kept him at home? 
Well, like, obviously, for people who don't know, it's basically between Rashford and Defoe, isn't it? Like, that was the choice. Everyone else was on the plane already. And I would take Rashford, despite Defoe's um, amazing series, series, season, um, I would take Rashford because I just don't think you can beat giving youth experience. And I think Defoe, even if he could help our chances at the Euros, it's, it's looking at the short term. Whereas Rashford coming in and getting maybe two or three games just even off the bench at the Euros, having the experience of being there. World Cup comes around and he's 20. He's only going to be 20 at the World Cup and he's got that experience. He's maybe got 15 caps for England. It's a lot better of a position to be in. Um, I think because you were saying about Neymar and his early pressure in his career, but like the guy's like 24 and he's got like, what, 70 caps for Brazil? I mean, he just had caps from the age of like 17. Just more caps you can get the better you're going to like uh, improve. So I would take Rashford. I think it's literally the country's like split down the middle though because you can't argue with Defoe's stats and his yeah. ability. But you have yeah. you kind of have a poor track record. Like I'm a personal fan. I love England. Like I love watching them in all competitions that they're not competing against the US and uh but you have a I poor, don't. <laughs> <laughs> you have a you have a poor track record of, you know, I could think back to a lot of the major competitions of you always bring in some young starlet and then that that's like the kiss of death to that kid, you know, like yeah. Walcott when Rooney got injured, like I don't know what was that, twelve or eight years ago, um, and then like uh, Oxlade Chamberlain, and then you know Sterling in the last World Cup. Actually, Sterling didn't have that bad of a World Cup, but then all of a sudden he starts sputtering out, and you see these kids, Townsend, yeah, Townsend, like you see these kids like come in, they were like, oh, it's good, at least we're giving them experience, and if anything, like as you said, you build these kids up to break them down. But, you know, and the flip side to that is I don't think that any of those kids, all those kids were hype. Like, they would show bursts, right? But they weren't scoring the type of goals. They weren't showing the type of, you know, the the meeting the moment. You know what I'm saying? Like, Rashford scoring those big, big goals up against Arsenal. You know, he's, that guy's a baller. Because by all accounts, they were talking about him in practice. He looked like rubbish. Like, in practice matches in, like, the under-21s, he was like, he didn't look that good. But in the moment, that kid's got killer instinct. And that is valuable on any level, no matter what age. If you can score in a big moment, that is valuable to any single team, no matter where you're playing. So hopefully he can buck the trend, but we will see. But with that, let's move on. Beautiful transition by me, by the way. Young Player of the Year. <laughs> Who do you guys think is the young player of the year? Now, if you want to put bias into it, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, say anything to it. But who do you guys think, Sam? Who do you think is your young player of the year? Of course, we're gonna classify it as 21 or under uh, for the, this season. The bias in me wants to say Rashford. Over wait, I'm... okay, over Martial for United. Well, we'll say this for another time. Continue. I'm sorry that I derailed you. Either one of them. I don't know. I honestly, I think Rashford is. Oh, I don't know if I'd say better. Uh, Martial, like Martial, I already sort of expected to be good. I guess. I guess there's a difference between young player and breakout player. But yeah, I, I don't know. Either one of those two. If I was being biased, um, they both have ice in their veins, dude. They're both. Fu- they're just cool, calm, collected. Like they have the three C's. They know what they need to do. Um, and Rashford, if going back to your point on Rashford, like I heard, St- I watched Stephen House on, on, on his YouTube channel and he talks cause he's really invested in the under 18s, under 21s. And he's also on full-time devils. Um, and he was talking about Rashford and he's like, this guy, like in under 21s and under 18s, he couldn't finish the ball. Like he's quick, he's strong, but he could not finish a ball. And I just think he's broken out really well. But the, if I'm not being biased, uh, I think it's got to be Deli Alley. That guy is, that guy is a baller. That guy is going to be. I don't want to put too much hype on him, but he's going to be probably England's best player in like five years, honestly. He's he's going to be insane. He's got the size. He's got the brain for it. Like He's just everything you need in a, in a central midfielder, and he's going to be a freak. As long as he stops like nutshotting people, like he's going to be pretty good. Uh, Jason- <laughs> no, he, could, he could do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> a timely nutshot. Uh, not, not the worst hack in the world. Jason, who, who is your young player of the season? Yeah, I'm glad Sam mentioned it. I'd also give it to Deli Ali. I think he's got a lot of technical ability, and it's it's good to see him have a nice breakout season for for Spurs. But I definitely think there's a good case to be said for Marcus Rashford. You know, just kind of bursting onto the scene when Man United needed someone to get some goals for him. Uh, I think he really contributed to that. And of course, Martial had a pretty good season. Yeah, 
All right. And JCC? Player, young player um, of the season. Well, everyone's saying Rashford, and I'm a Man United fan, but you can't look past Ian Acho. I mean, he's got like That's four, good four, more, four or five more goals than Rashford yep. in the same amount of time, broken on the scene. I think he's one year older. Um, I think he's got more... I think he's got better players behind him as well. <laughs> and City oh, score more yeah. goals, so... Yeah, I mean, look at the goal Rashford scored against West Ham. A couple step overs in out of two yeah. players into the top right. Ian Acho's had tap-ins, basically. But... Um, yeah, I mean, it'll be interest- it's interesting to see next season how it- it's kind of like they're building those two as rivals, aren't they, really? Like, as the two players who are up and coming in the Man United, in the uh, Manchester teams. So, yeah, I personally would have Rashford as he's English and I'm a United fan, but you can't look past Ian Acho. Yeah, Ian Acho, a phenomenal talent. Uh, so is Martial. Let everybody know, I posted on my Twitter, I pinned it there, that even before we signed Martial, I let it be known that we should be signing that kid. That is my one claim to glory. <laughs> it was two <laughs> weeks before we signed Martial, and everybody was like, who the fuck is this kid? I was like, yeah, I knew. I knew all along. I didn't know. Yeah, but uh, he's in career mode. <laughs> he's a beast. You should join our uh, our fortune telling. Yes, yes, yes. Firm. I'll join your yeah. consulting firm. Um, yes. <laughs> but as I need to find a place. Yeah. <laughs> but as, but as much as I, I'd like to say the bias, and I, I think Rashford and, and Martial have have ice in their veins at least for the moment. Like Mar, I said it many times. Like I don't I don't even like know if Martial is happy when he scores goals. Sometimes like he just kind of <laughs> runs over. Like he would if he was born in Germany during World War Two. He's the guy like that could probably pull. The the gas chamber like the buttons of the gas chamber and just walk away and sleep like yeah. a baby at night like he's that cold-blooded of a killer. there's got to be a meme for this yeah <laughs> <laughs> even like, rashford like when he scores big goals he doesn't celebrate like a madman he just puts his arms out like i scored like it's it's not even a big deal for him like he's just he just looks like he's been there for so long yes but we'll we'll save we'll, we're probably going to be doing an, an end of the season review for manchester United, so we'll save it to that i'm gonna give it to another totten tottenham Hot Spurs, as we say in America, <laughs> uh, uh, guy, and that would be Harry Kane. We're talking about Ian Nacho. We're talking about Matthias. We're talking about Rasher. These guys are still all developing. The player, you know, the young guy that burst onto the scene, this story of last season, made it come, made it come through. He's not a one season wonder. He's not a flash in the pan. He is a fully developed player. And we say like, yeah, Matthias had a nice finish here. Ian Nacho had a couple tap ins. Uh, Rashford had a couple step overs and a nice little tuck into the top corner. Kane was doing it on the reg. Like he was absolutely blasting like these curlers in from distance all over the place. And I guess it's not really like, it doesn't count because it didn't happen in the VPL, but, uh, what he did against Germany, just a little bit of a turn and then the clinicalness to get it past like Neuer is just phenomenal for a player. And we, we forget cause he's old news. We live in the Twitter age. That, like, these players are like, oh, well, kind of old news, but what is he, 21, 22? Still? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely phenomenal, his finishes. And uh, a guy that, once again, that we hype up and we love to, br- you know, England, I'm saying we, that's how much I love England, is that, <laughs> like, uh, that, that, that you guys love to go ahead and build up and you want to break down. He came through in the clutch this season, and he, he was the catalyst as much as anything. You know, they had a good defense, but... He scored a lot of crucial goals playing, you know, he had a lot better team around him than, you know, Defoe did, but it was a lot of times like Harry Kane coming through in the clutch. And that's why for me, you know, I can definitely see, you know, I have no arguments against, you know, Mr. Deli over there, but for me, it was, it was Kane this year for young players. I, I didn't go Kane cause he's 22. I didn't know if you were going to punish me. Was he 21 at the start like... of the season? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, yeah, he would be if he's 22 now, but okay. Uh, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And uh, now moving on from young player of the season, we're going to head and move on to the most valuable player. And now you can classify this in many ways. You could say, oh, maybe he was the best player in the league. Or you can classify it as, as some might argue, as he was most valuable, as in he was most valuable to his team. Without him, maybe, you know, they don't finish where they finish. Uh, let's go ahead and start it out with Sam. Who do you... Th- who- do you think was the MVP of their team this season? Um, gee, let me think. Maybe David De Gea. Oh, the bias! <laughs> the bias is real. No, it's not even bias, dude. Like that. Oh, how can your goalkeeper be your best player on your team? I don't understand. He, 
I don't want you want to think about life without him. Remember when we did that United review and you're like, oh yeah, he's going to leave to Madrid. And I'm like, there's a 0% chance he's going to move to Madrid. <laughs> Consulting <laughs> like, firm, I'm, man. Consulting I'm firm. I'm like, I'm in love with De Gea. Like, he, oh man, without him, we'd be fucked. So I, it has to be De Gea. Like, I, obviously, less the players, the Lamares and Kante, obviously. But other than those two, it's got to be De Gea. Come on. How can you argue any other way? I could see I could see your argument because as you as we've mentioned, Manchester United weren't exactly a goal scoring machine this season. A lot of eked out wins, and there were more often than not uh, times where we won by maybe one goal, and the difference was David de Gea. So we're gonna go on that metric of how valuable they are to the team, and you know they don't get as many points without that guy. I can see I can see de Gea right there. Jason, who do you who is your most valuable player? I was going to say Mares just purely in terms of goals created, but I think Sam raises a good point. If you look at the metric um, in terms of like importance to their team, I think you guys, I don't know where you'd be sitting without David De Gea. What is going like, on who, here? <laughs> I thought what, what do you mean? What do you biased. mean? I was like, who would actually say that David De Gea is the most valuable player in the season? Not from you, Jason. I expected this from Sam, but hey, not you, you know, Jason. I think it's. I think it's a fair <laughs> argument. I think you guys defense without David De Gea would be not good. Yeah. Who who would you have instead of David De Gea? Who's no one. No one. I, I, I would in, not in even goal? I would not even have Neuer. In, I want De Gea. In Neuer. goal or are you saying like in the league? In goal. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. But uh I don't know. I don't two who are you guys going for De Gea? That is that's surprising. I'm glad I got I'm glad I got Flick on board. <laughs> <laughs> JCC, are you gonna are you gonna are you gonna complete the track factor here? Yeah, David. No, uh, I'm going with uh, I, Jamie Vardy because mm. I think that period of the mid, like not just the goal, not just the overall goals, but that period of the eleven goals in a row when they mm. needed to grind out results mid season, where like every te- there's always a team like maybe every other season that like is up there, and you think, oh, this team's gonna finish in the top four. Like Southampton did it a couple of seasons ago. West Ham looked like they're gonna do it this season. And they kind of, they just drift away. But with Jamie Vardy's goals, like just winning those games 1-0 with him just scoring that one goal and then another one and another one and keeping that momentum and it was all about Jamie Vardy. The whole team was focused on it. You know, I think Mahrez earned a penalty and walked up to it and then turned and, was like, and gave it to Vardy for him to score his 10th. And I just think that you know crucial period of the season that might go a little bit under the radar, he kept them in it and I think that value, you know, but you could argue a case for every single one of them or David De Gea. <laughs> I would, you know, I was going to say Mares, but I think you just convinced me to turn to Vardy because if you go on the metric of yeah, like total total goals either created or assisted or or scored, like Mares is pretty much up there. And there was that point at the end of the season where Mares kind of picked up the slack when Vardy was, um, when Vardy was uh, basically suspended. But if we're gonna through the narrative that we've written throughout this podcast is that like it was because. Leicester were atop of the league for so long and they could play that counterattacking football and it was because they were so fearless. Psychology wise, Vardy is arguably the most fearless player that I've ever seen. You know, well maybe not ever seen, but that's that played the game this season. There was that aura about him. The man looks like a shark. Like his head actually <laughs> looks like a shark <laughs> on the freaking field. Like on the freaking pitch and he's like tearing through he doesn't care who the fuck was in front of him he didn't he there was absolutely zero fear and the team took after that early and often and when he was going on that run they had that air of invincibility and they rode that wave it was it was they had momentum early on they they don't really they didn't really sputter and it fed into their whole air of fearlessness and i was thinking that well mars is an absolutely sensational player the things that he can do technically were tremendous and he definitely without them they probably don't win the league but for an attitude like the intangibles of bringing in an attitude and and bringing a fearlessness to a team and giving them belief that they can win I would say that Jamie Vardy giving them that early lead in the season probably edges it out for me. That's more intangibles than anything, but yeah, I think we're going two two over here, De Gea. There's it's been very few strikers to like help your point. There's been very few strikers that have led their team yeah. by being a striker. Like usually you look at the midfielders, usually center backs. Recently the game's been about wingers and inverted wingers mm-hmm. cutting in and shooting. It's very rare nowadays to see a striker really f- for the team to take after the striker. 
Like it's it's very rare now to see that. Yeah. Mm. Um, but with that, I think that's pretty much going to wrap up. We've had a long, long, but quite, quite fun and entertaining discussion about the Premier League. And I think uh, any closing thoughts on this this year? Where do you guys think this is going to, what does this think? Uh, what, what do you have any predictions since we're all in the, <laughs> the prediction? We're all in the consulting team now, the consulting firm <laughs> of Flick, JCC, Guardi FIFA, and Be Modest. Uh, do you have any predictions on how next season... Any bold predictions on how next season's going to go ahead and pan out, uh, Sam? You could oh, JCC, you could literally say it. you could literally say anything, and nobody could question you. You could just you could <laughs> you could say like Sunderland to win the league, like we said. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> there is no holding back on this. <laughs> yeah, so go for it. Say say something wild, and then you're like, "Hey, eh, Leicester won the league." So my bold <laughs> prediction. Is that Burnley's going to win the league? <laughs> <laughs> Never before. Got to win the league. <laughs> there you go. They won the championship, so they could win the Premier League. There you go. They got some. They got some nice kits. So anything is possible. Hey, Leicester won the league. Jason, any bold predictions or any closing thoughts on uh, this season? I go with Burnley as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> close it yeah. all out. Let's look up. Look, Sam, go ahead. Look up the odds on Burnley, so we can go ahead and, and tell about the end. JCC. Oh, what are what are your predictions? Um, Guardiola for relegation with City. Oh, wow. <laughs> Leicester. Leicester won the league. Actually, that's not a bad happen. shout. I wouldn't. I could easily see them winning the league next season, and also seeing them not make top four next season, mm-hmm. like with with City. Uh, I would say yeah. That'll Burnley be- is three thousand to one. By the way. Lock it up. I'll take that. Lock it up. Just put ten. Less. They've got the, they've got a better chance than Leicester winning us. So. Lock it up. You've heard it here first. This will be on the YouTube's when you're all millionaires. Go ahead, put a hundred pound on that, and you're welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but yeah, I guess that'll be my prediction: is that uh, City doesn't make top four next year because you know whatever Leicester won the league. And let's go ahead and close it out with our most favoritest segment of the show, and that is worst comments guys uh sam and, and jason have have been on here before we'll save jcc for last because i've seen a couple of your videos you your your comment section can be kind of aidsy sometimes so we'll <laughs> we'll uh we'll save you for last because i think you're gonna have the winner here uh jason let's start off with you what was what's a, a good comment that you've had recently well there's this guy that's it's been getting kind of annoying um goes by the name of iGame in hd oh the worst uh, <laughs> Every Fucking episode worse. of my Liverpool career mode, he's obsessed with Mignolet. Uh I recently signed Karios, def- which Liverpool signed in real life. Uh, definitely a better replacement, but he's just not having it. Um, so the comment I've chosen, keep Mignolet. 100% of the goals conceded were not his fault. That is not true. Also, in big games when under pressure, he always provides me a great shot stopper. The exact reason I don't start him in big games, uh, give Simone a full season, which I've decided to, to do and keep him. So. Yeah, that, that's my that's my comment. Oh. Fanboys, they're just yeah. He's been he's now been two of the worst comments. He was one on mine and now one on Flix. Oh, there yep. you go. Well, if you guys see that guy in the comment section of any of our videos, slag him off, guys. Just yeah. he deserves it. He really does. He's annoying. Yeah, he's annoying. What a twat. All right, Sam. What a, what is your worst comment? Um, this is like far back, but I haven't been on the podcast in a while. So it was when I was doing my Arsenal career mode, and I was signing a new keeper after check. Uh, left he wanted to leave um even though he was like 80 years old or whatever and a a guy commented because everybody was signing telling me to sign courtois but he had just recently joined uh by munich and this guy said why did you not sign courtois spelled courtois wrong of course and he proceeded to call me a cunt bitch (laughs) not not one both of them a cunt bitch um, and it's actually been pretty funny because like, my brother knows that I do YouTube. I told him and it's been like a little running joke between us. So, yeah, <laughs> okay. it's actually been it's actually been really funny. <gasps> That's like even funnier than like an Australian accent. I could even think it was like, so how's the YouTube going, you cunt bitch? Like, <laughs> that's, yeah, honestly, like, every, like he calls me a cunt bitch now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's a good comment in a way. Uh, my worst comment, I've been away uh, for the past week. Uh, so I haven't really been checking the comment. But this one, this one I actually saw recently. And this one just more hurts the brain. And uh, basically, Ronaldo is retiring in my Man United uh, see, uh, this season in my Man United career mode. 
And uh, one of the comments said innocuously, it's like, hey, when Ronaldo and Messi, you know, retire, you should get the regens. And then another commenter commented under him and said, uh, I don't think you should actually do that. And then everybody was like, why not? That's a decent idea. And he said, because to him, Messi and Ronaldo are irreplaceable. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, interesting. Oh god. Because well, the con- the there will never be another messier room. Yeah. It, he said specifically to him. To him, they are irreplaceable. Mm. <laughs> right. So yeah. I opinion. mean, everybody is entitled to their opinion, and I respect that you have that opinion, but that was But they kind of do get replaced, like literally get replaced. Yeah, I was like, literally, that's exactly what they a regen is. Messier yeah, that <laughs> that is what a regen is. So just like just mind boggling right there. But <laughs> Once again, fanboys, fanboys, uh, incredible. All right, JCC, let's close this out. <laughs> I'll, go to, I'll go over them quickly. The one is I had somebody basically ask me, you guys probably had it before, but he's like, yo, I don't have any money, so can you pay for my Xbox Live, oh. to paraphrase it. And I went, <laughs> and I was just really bored, and I was like, sorry, dude, um, I only get paid in 50s because I obviously I'm a YouTuber, so I'm so well off. Um, so if you want... I've got a wad coming in today I can transfer to you. And he's like, like, how many is it? And I was like, oh, it normally comes in tens, so it'd be about 500 pounds. And he's like, yeah, that should do it. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, I can tell the guy's quite young, so I'm not having him on too much. But then I get a load of commenters and subs jumping in like, some are like, don't do it, like, Jay-Z, don't do it. And some are like, like going along with it, like, oh, I remember when he gave me mine and all this <laughs> stuff and it's going on and on. And then, <laughs> this kid's getting so excited. And obviously, you know how it goes, like, Stuff I didn't I didn't think too much more of it, and then I got I just found the other one, but I couldn't find the original. But on this next video of the the next episode, I just get a uh, hello JCC. You never gave me that code. I really <laughs> need it, mate. <laughs> and then one of my mates in the team in my VFL team goes, I apologise on behalf of JCC. He has an incredibly busy schedule. I, a member of the team or another member of the management, will assist you shortly. And the kid just goes, okay, so. Somewhere heartbroken is a kid waiting for a 500 quid to come through <laughs> from me. Poor kid. Life. Yeah, you just like, yeah. you and your team it just picked on some like 10 year old. <laughs> I know, I know. That's why I just kind of stopped. But uh, I like how he's like, yeah, I need Xbox Live. And you're like, yeah, 500 pounds. Is that enough? He's like, yeah, that should do. <laughs> that should do. <laughs> yeah. And then I got a, I have a couple, oh, I have a lot of subs on Skype. And this one guy, I can read the exact messages. It goes, JCC, 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 JCC. Uh, join my midweek league. Please join it. This is over days and days. Uh, please, JCC. JCC, I'm number one fan. Please apply. JCC, I have a question. And then a couple of days later, in caps, why are you so fucking ignorant, you cunt? <laughs> so <I just laughs> this is... Hello. So I put, hello, what's up? And he goes, I love your channel. <laughs> <laughs> that is... You Logic. know what you have experienced is the exact same thing that, like, hot girls experience on Tinder... When they like swipe and they never talk to a guy, it's just like it's just that. It's just like oh, day later they just pepper you, and then the moment that they respond back, and then if they don't respond, you're just like you're a fucking fat bitch. Like, and then the moment you respond back, they're like, it was like, why would you call me that? It was like I don't know. So you want to get a cup of coffee? <laughs> so there, yeah, you, my friend did it. You, you now now you you have experienced what it's like to be a cute girl on Tinder. There you guys go. Worst <laughs> comments of the year amazing guys well let's go ahead and plug it up jcc what is going on in your channel man uh continuing the pro clubs vfl series some very strange real life videos that i seem to find myself making as well um but yeah that's about it <laughs> all right and of course guys go ahead and click on any of uh you know our faces right now if you want to go ahead and check them out go ahead get them and subscribe jason what is going on in your channel right now currently liverpool career mode uh, just started up the Pro Club series, and uh, due to this—that's right—due to this podcast, uh, I was motivated to start a Youth Academy crewmate after watching the Youth Academy podcast. Yeah. So, got that going on. Cutsy. All right, all right. Go ahead and check that guy out, Sam. What are you up to? I am currently doing a Napoli career mode, and it's very fun. I'm trying to keep it realistic, and there's a bit of a twist because when I come up against Juventus. I actually come up against Tyler, who's doing Juventus career mode. So, 
bit of a challenging aspect to it as well. All right, all right. And on my channel, if you're here, you're probably watching all that stuff. But we have the lovely podcast. We got Manchester United keep on going on. We got a, a my player going on. You can also find myself uh, featured occasionally on Jason's Pro Club series, as well as uh, I'm back from Japan and I vlogged uh, most of it. In fact, there were points where I would get a call on Skype uh, yes. while I was in Japan. <laughs> And then I would just randomly answer <laughs> I was about over to video. I was like, "Hey, I'm in a I'm in a train station in Japan right now. How's it guys going?" But uh, yeah, you guys can go ahead. I'll probably get that vlog out and uh, announcement. I will be attending VidCon again this season. Not season. What the fuck am I talking about? This year uh, in the summer. So that's coming up. So definitely uh, be on the lookout if you guys are going to VidCon. Uh, say what's up. I can probably find some time. Meet you guys up. And with that, we're going to go ahead and conclude this episode of the Master Debate Tours. Thank you to everybody who came on. Jason C., Jason, uh, Sam, Tyler, for the 30 minutes that we had him. It's been absolutely lovely. Love to have all you guys back on. Once again, say goodbye to the people, JCC. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been a pleasure to be here. Yeah, say goodbye, Jason. Until next time. And Sam. Bye. And I am going to say farewell as as well because I gotta fucking pee. All right, later, guys. Bye. Stay humble. Later. And be weird. <laughs> weird.